Hello, welcome to the Freedom from Anger podcast. I'm joined today with Sonny Von Cleveland. He is definitely a man of many things. He's lived a very interesting life, and he's here to share his story with us of perseverance, overcoming things. He's vocalist, actor, but he's also spent 18 years in prison. So he's obviously overcome a lot of things in his life. But now his main motivation is to speak to people and allow them to realize that they can overcome adversity and live the life of their dreams. Thanks for being on here, Sonny. Hey, James. Thanks for having me, man. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. I'm sorry I couldn't fit everything in that intro. <laughs> we, we talked briefly before we started recording. And I mean, you definitely got a story to tell. Yeah, there's a couple things. Yeah. So that's that's why I wanted you on here. So you can give that story and hopefully inspire people to realize that even at your lowest, there's there's always that silver lining. There's always that well, that goal that you can reach towards. It's it's like it's rock bottom became the most amazing place I've ever been. Right. I was fortunate enough to to learn from a very wise individual when you're at rock bottom and you recognize that a lot of people think they've hit rock bottom, right? But sometimes it's really not rock bottom, right? When you hit rock bottom, there's absolutely nowhere else to go except upward, right? And so if you think that you're at rock bottom and then things fall apart or keep getting worse, you clearly haven't hit the bottom yet. Right? So, because when you hit the bottom, there's nowhere else to go. And then, and you, and You'll come to that realization, like I've got nowhere else to go, but up. And then it's, it's a matter of choice, how you rebuild, right? Everything in life is a choice. And that's primarily what I speak on and, and teach is the, is choice, right? Everything in life comes to choice. And if we learn how to define choice, we know how to navigate more appropriately. And choice is defined by the existence of an event and your response to it. And that's it. And that is literally every single waking moment of every day of our life. And we will learn how to separate that one moment where we, we isolate and realize that here's a moment of choice. You can navigate life however you want to, and there's nothing that can stop you or get in your way of whatever you want, because you have the freedom of choice. Yes. You're definitely preaching to the choir. If you look at the Dr. Albert Ellis and his REBT. It's all about choice. Everything we do is about choice. That is definitely an unpopular view on things because it's always somebody else's sure. fault. Sure. They made me mad. They did this. Sure. No, but like you said, how you respond to it, that's on you. 100%. Now, now reacting, now it's kind of a, kind of murky waters there because when I get filled up with my emotions and I, I get hot headed and I lash out. I'm usually reacting. It's quick. It's dirty. It's, right. I, I'm not really thinking it through. And then as soon as those words come out of my mouth, then my brain kicks in and goes, Oh shit. Yeah. I probably shouldn't have said that. Right. And, uh, but, and there's the, there's the fine line there, James. When we, uh -huh. when we learned that, that reaction, what is that react? It's, it's what? It's a choice. Yeah. Right? You yeah. choose the way you react. And so if you're able to, identify that here come the emotions and before you say the thing, mm -hmm. right? You stop and recognize, okay, I'm, I'm having this emotion. I get to choose how I respond, how I'm going to articulate the emotion that I'm having is my choice. Mm -hmm. And, and you don't have to choose, act a certain way. You don't have to respond, mm -hmm. right? That's the beautiful thing is you don't have to do anything. You can just do it. You know, if, if I'm in a hostile situation and something goes awry, I can choose to just, you know what, I'm going to turn around and not even, it's not even going to exist in my world. I'm just going to turn around and walk away from it because I know that there's no positive outcome. And if something in my life doesn't fall into happiness and kindness or compassion, I don't engage in it, which is a choice. Right? Yes. But often what we do is we ignore the signals. So we sure. ignore our body. Just here recently, I was dealing with somebody and I could feel my blood pressure. I mean, it was creeping up. But from 
what I know about anger management. I knew right then and there. All right, you need to exit the situation the best way you can. Keep your mouth shut because it's creeping up there. But for a lot of people, they don't pay attention to the the biological signals and they just boom. And the next thing you know, they're regretting what they're doing. So that's why we really focus on, hey, pay attention to your body, get in touch with your body because it's going to tell you from the jump, whether you're attacking me verbally or physically, my brain does not know the difference. Sure. That fight, that fight, flight, or freeze is going to happen. Sure. And all that uh, adrenaline, cortisol, all that stuff gets working in our bodies. And a lot of people say, oh, I see red in you know, all this. Like, no, nah, you don't. No. No, you're getting flustered and your body's reacting. And then you react and then you try to blame it on right. whatever. Accountability. You know? is a big thing. Able to say that this is, this, this happened because I made a choice to respond this way is it's not easy for people to do, right? It's, it's not because at the end of the day, 99% of the world acts and reacts to things based on the perception and opinion of others, right? They don't, we don't realize that we need, we don't do what we want to do. We do what we think is acceptable by the people around us. And that's where, you know, the problem starts. Yeah. I don't know when this happened. It happened sometime in my lifetime and your lifetime. We're, we're probably similar ages. You're probably younger than me, but anyway. I'll be 42 it, next month. But yeah. I mean, it became unfashionable to be an individual. Sure. You gotta be a part, you gotta be a part of a group. And I get it. It's the whole love and belonging. You want to be a part of a group. You want to be part of a society. But I mean, there's such, I don't know, lack of a better word, just sweetness and just being a weirdo, doing your own thing, you know, just not giving a flip. We all have inherent individuality, but, you know, Epictetus, I'm a big student of the Stoics and I I love Stoic philosophy. And Epictetus said, we are all born for the sake of each other either teach or tolerate. And I mean, that's such a profound teaching. If you're not somebody that's, that has a propensity or an inclination to want to teach people, then tolerate, right? Because we are communal people at the end of the day, everybody needs, there's no such thing as I do this all on my own. No one ever came into this world alone and no one's leaving alone. You know, you hear that prop, that, that, that very famous cliche saying of, I came in this world by myself. I'm leaving by myself. That's not necessarily true because there were uh, doctors that pulled you out of your mother and <laughs> there are people that are going to carry you and put you in a casket, right? So you did not come in and you will not leave by yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people in an effort to express their individuality, try to break away from the communal thing, right? They, they try to separate and stand out and say, I don't need people. I don't need to be a part of a community. I don't need to, I don't need that. I'm an individual. They don't understand how to be an individual and part of your community at the same Mm -hmm. time. And, and, but some of them, some people do get that. And that's where you find your great leaders of the world, right? These are the people that say, okay, I know how to be kind and compassionate and authentic with everybody around me. At the same time, express my views, opinions, and beliefs in the world in a kind and compassionate manner. And that's what separates leaders and teachers from followers and followers aren't necessarily a bad thing, right? Everybody has to be a follower at some point. You can't lead without following. Yeah. That's the basis of Albert Ellis. That's the basis of CBT. And I actually have a couple of quotes like written down here on my little, my little notepad because I I just love going in there and just digging around. And I I love old quotes because it shows you that 2000 plus years ago, the human condition has not changed. Right. Like we were having the same issues back then as we're having now. We're more supposedly more educated now than we were back then. Well, but definitely more know, experienced. Yeah. We have, we have access to more stuff. Right. Just <laughs> to more information. Right. Yeah. But uh, you talk about Epictetus, you know, and this one here is, is any person capable Angering you becomes your master. Thanks. He can anger you only when you permit yourself to be disturbed by him. 
100 percent epictetus yeah. was a slave right he was a, a he was someone that was purchased by such a an evil person i mean this guy broke his leg right just for fun mm -hmm. right <laughs> just torturing mm -hmm. him and and epictetus is the epitome of i choose how i respond to something right and he's telling him you're going to break my leg and i'm not going to be of, of as good of service to you as i am with my leg intact mm -hmm. so you shouldn't break my leg because it's going to hurt i'm going to heal and you're not going to change who i am but if for you're you're not thinking logically you're going to break my leg and it's not going to do any of us any good and and the guy didn't listen so he broke his leg but epictetus didn't break his belief Right, mm -hmm. you, you you can break my leg, but you're not going to break my belief in life. And Epic, I mean, I think Epictetus was one of the most amazing philosophers and Stoic teachers of the world. Right? Yeah, we got him. We got Marcus Aurelius. Love Marcus Aurelius. Right? Yeah, yeah. The best revenge is not to be like your enemy. I think you Marcus know. Aurelius is <laughs> probably hands down the greatest world leader in the history of mankind. Right, in in my opinion. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of great world leaders, but Marcus Aurelius ran the Roman empire in a time when it was so hostile and things were so crazy. And yet he maintained himself by writing every day. You know, meditations wasn't supposed mm -hmm. to be a published book. No, you know, this, These were the writings <laughs> to himself to keep himself honest every day and, and wrote his musings to himself. But what an amazing piece of writing for us to discover because the man is just the absolute epitome of of leadership and kindness and compassion in, in what you you do but at, at the same time he was a fantastic emperor <laughs> he was mm -hmm. fantastic at what he did he was a fantastic leader as far as journaling like was that something that you did when you're incarcerated i think it saves it, it absolutely does it saves your life so i wrote daily i don't do it as much anymore, but I, I highly encourage it. Be, I, I've done it enough to where it, it just, I think I learned the lesson from it. Doesn't mean that I couldn't benefit from it now if I, if I didn't, if I did it. But yeah, I, so when I was incarcerated again, I was incarcerated for 18 years and I spent 19 months in particular in one stretch in solitary confinement that, that changed my life. And I met a Muslim man in the hole who was across the hall from me. And he was the, the, the one that really saved my life and got through to me. Cause he would call over to me constantly. Hey, white boy, Hey, white boy, come talk to me, man. Come talk to me. And, and so that's the title of my book is Hey, white boy, conversations <laughs> of redemption. I refused so hard at first to talk to him, right? I would just cuss him out. Cause I was in such an, an angry state of mind. And I mean, this is a, this man is, is a certain sect of, of Muslim that normally we're not going to get along right in prison. We're not going to talk to each other. We're not going to. We're not going to communicate at all. But in this hole, we're the only ones down here. We're at the end of the hallway in solitary confinement. And as he said, we're all we got. And there's nobody else down here. And journaling became a part of it, of, of every day of my life. Writing my life out was such a significant thing for me. There's a, a, a system that you can do. If you live your life in reverse, you can recall your entire life in, in a matter of 10 minutes. It's just the way the brain works, you know, trying to live it forward. If you try to tell me your entire life story, everywhere you were in your life from birth till now, it's going to be very difficult for you to do. It's hard to recall. Mm -hmm. But if you do it in reverse, before I was here, I was here. Before I was here, mm -hmm. I was here. You can recall your entire life in 10 minutes. And as I started to do that, I started to learn the, the, the reason behind the exercise is that I can go back and isolate every one of the major moments in my life and find out where the trauma happened and where the good things happened, where the bad things happened. And then I can go into those further and I can write about them and I can write what I was feeling. I can write out the, the emotions that I, I loved, the emotions that I hated. And when you do that, it's, it's exercising, right? It's exercising the emotion that are, are inside of you and it's putting it down on paper and articulating to the universe, what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. And it, and it literally lifts it off of your, your conscious, right? It takes it off of your chest and, and writing is such a powerful, powerful routine and you should make it a habit every day of your life. Yeah. A little while ago, I read Matthew McConaughey's book and his whole book is him sitting down with all of his journals 
like apparently he had been journaling since he was a kid. Yeah. And he just kind of sat down with all of his journals, looked back at everything and kind of reflected on it. Me personally, that's something I didn't ever do, but I'd be kind of curious of what 15 year old James was thinking. Cause I don't remember those days, but could I learn something from sure. that mentality? You absolutely can. Yeah. We always can learn. You something. didn't, you didn't forget. You just haven't thought about, right? Your, your mind has an infinite capacity to remember. And so if you sat down and, and relived your life, you would find that the memories would come back and you, you're able to recall way more than you think. Yeah. Right? Try telling that. An exor exercise that actually, if you habitualize it, yeah. you'd be surprised at how much you can remember. Yeah. Your store is amazing. So you did your time, get out. It, it's a pretty crazy Crazy ride. I always was passionate about music. Music was my escapism as a child because I grew up horribly abused. I was sexually abused most of my life, starting from the time I was five years old by a, a handful of different men, primarily four men from the time I was five until I was 10. And my mom had this amazing tape box full of such an eclectic group of music. And that's what I would do whenever her friends are over because a couple of her friends were the ones that molested me and her boyfriend. And whenever these, these men were around, I would grab the tape box and go to the closet and put the headphones on it and, and listen to Harry Chapin and listen to White Snake and listen to Meatloaf. <laughs> I, I kid you not. I have a signed picture of Meatloaf on my wall right here. That's my amazing. Wa my wife got it for me. I'm like you. I want stories. Tell right. me a story in a song. Right. That's why and, I loved Harry Chapin. Harry Chapin yeah. is not just a masterful musician, but a masterful storyteller. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. amazingly puts stories to music and it, it's incredible. And so I, I grew up with such a passion for music. And when, during my, my 19 month stay in the hole with Mallory Bay, I discovered that music is my passion. And, and when I get out of prison, I want to pursue music and that's a choice, right? And so I get to choose that. And, you know, I'm surrounded by staff and people that are telling me that the best thing you're going to be able to, to hope for is a, a supervisor position at a factory. And because, you know, you got a lot of felonies, and you've done a lot of time in prison. So, you know, don't set your expectations too high because then you'll, you'll lose. And then you, that's a, a great way to, to, to recidivate because, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to get down on yourself and you're going to have a loser's mentality. And the whole time I'm just thinking to myself, like, you people suck at inspiring people. <laughs> you really suck at this because there's no limitation. I, mean, you, I can get out of here and do anything I want to do. I'm not restricted to a factory job. You're out of your mind. And so that's what I did when I got out. I immediately, I went to work like everybody else. You know, I got up at seven o'clock every day. I joined the union. I, I worked a demolition job. And every day I went to work, work 50 hours a week. But I started to pursue music as soon as I hit the ground. This is one of the primary things that I, I teach is kindness and compassion work everywhere. Yeah. Right? I went from battling COs physically. I've been mm -hmm. gassed and cell extracted more times than I can count. I have been chained mm -hmm. to the showers and beaten by the police. I have been mm -hmm. hogtied and thrown out and pepper sprayed and kicked and stumped because I have beaten COs. I have broken out of my cell. I have, I've mm -hmm. slammed them to the ground. I've kicked the shit out of them. I have, or it's been a war. And when I'm at, in the hole on this particular stint, I learned that compassion and kindness work with everybody. From the same officer that was coming down and slamming my food slot shut and cussing me out. Mm -hmm. When I started to thank him for bringing me mm -hmm. meals. You know, thank you, man. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Just that little act of kindness itself turned them around. And now yeah. I've got an extra five minutes in the shower. I've got an extra 10 minutes on the yard. I've got, well, we got an extra tray. You want this? Yeah, man. Thank yeah. you so much. I greatly appreciate you, my friend. I hope you're having a good day. Blah, blah, blah. Right. And you start treating yeah. them like human beings and they respond in kind. Right? Yeah. Kill them with it's kindness. A, Kill them with kindness. Yeah. But, it, but it, it works. Yeah. I try to tell our guys that all the time. You're fighting, losing battle. One thing is you don't you don't know what battle they're dealing with, right? Because you're not them. Right. That's why yeah. I think I think the game of chess is one of the greatest tutors of all time. Right? 
if you learn how to actually sit down and play chess, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's the greatest tutor of all time, right? Like you learn mm -hmm. patience, right? You learn how to cooperate and work with what you've got to mm -hmm. achieve the end that you want, right? It's not about making the, the, the easiest and readiest available move. Right. It's about thinking strategically and, and yeah. you can apply that philosophy to any area of your life, even corrections officers. Right. I know mm -hmm. some of them come in and it's so hard to reach some of the younger people because I primarily work with juveniles because mm -hmm. I went to prison when I was 16 and I was a convicted felon by age seven. Right. Mm -hmm. So I know about, about crime and I know about interacting with police and corrections officers and the younger ones are the hardest ones to reach because they feel like they have this burden of proof they have mm -hmm. to prove themselves to the world and they don't want they, they don't want to listen they they want to they want to talk they want to be expressive mm -hmm. and if we can just teach them the game of chess i think it, it really helps them in life because most mm -hmm. most kids don't want to listen they they again they want to talk they don't want to listen and if we teach them chess at an early age it gives them an advantage of how to think of how to strategize, of how to plot your f movement yeah. forward. And, and you, you see a lot of correlation between chess and, and right. real life conversation, the way you interact with people. I think chess is an incredible game. Did you know that chess was created by an autistic person? I do not know that. Well, all right. Well, since we're obviously been recording for a while, but anyway, so get out of prison, you're doing just kind of a mundane job. How do you go from? No. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was working demolition in the union. You know, working 60, 50, 60 hours a week. And I met a guy. I was taking my ex's son to Guitar Center. This Guitar Center is like my Disneyland. Uh, I can just play with everything and it's fantastic. And I met a, a drummer named Mike Scarbelli in Guitar Center. And they said they were looking for a bass player. And I'm like, I'm absolutely down to play bass in a band because I just want to make music. And so I came out, joined their band, and we quickly realized that our lead singer was not very good and that I could do a better job. So we, he got kicked out of the band and then I jumped over to vocals and I go a million miles an hour on anything that I do, right? I don't believe in half-assing it. I don't believe in, in going slow. What is the goal here? The goal is to become professional musicians and make a living making music. So let's do that. So I started immediately putting pieces into place for marketing and promotion and, mm. and got us a gig very quickly. And it was too much for these guys. So I ended up getting kicked out of the band, not because I wasn't a good performer, but because they wanted it to be more of a hobby. Man, it's I doing wanted too to, much. Right. I wanted it to be a career. So, okay. I appreciate you guys. I don't, it doesn't, doesn't bother me a bit. I'm going to go out here and, and make a band of my own. And at the same time, I ended up, the venue that we played our show at, I met the owner and he and I hit it off so good. And he has become one of my closest friends and a mentor to me in my life. And his name's Anthony. So I, and it turned out I lived like a mile away from the club. So it really worked out. I went back to the club and I started interacting with Anthony and I actually became the general manager of the club. And so you'll come to find there's a common theme in my life. And it's that I'm way busier than any human being should be. <laughs> so, so I'm working work? my full-time, my <laughs> full-time gig doing the union work. And now I'm also running a club and trying to do music. So I meet a lot of musicians running this club. I was a general manager of music links in Menor, Ohio and meet a lot of bandmates. And after, I don't know, a good eight months or whatever of running this club, I decided to put a band together. and. It went so lightning fast, it wasn't funny. I, nine days, we built the band. Like none of us had even met except me and my best friend who was a drummer from Michigan who came down to stay with us. I, he, I knew a, a mutual, mutual musical friend who needed a drummer. I, so the drummer came in, I introduced him. Turns out you also need a guitar player and a vocalist and a bass player because you literally don't have anything. So you need a whole band. But he's got this slot at an upcoming show in nine days and he, we want to fill it so i said let's just start a whole new band start a new project i've got some songs that i wrote while i was in prison on acoustic guitar i can teach them to you guys and we can jam out a show it's a 30 minute set five songs we got this and we did and in nine days we built this band grim trigger wrote a song and came out to the stage and murdered it 
I mean, we did such a fantastic job. And 90 days later, we're signed to Ferocious Records, right? We're signed to a label and I'm mind blown, right? I'm like, holy shit. In 90 days, we went from not even knowing each other to signed to a record label, right? And I'm in the studio. We're recording an album. We've recorded a couple of singles already. We shot a music video. Put it out. I'm like, this is insanity. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm on a van with a trailer to Pittsburgh. We're going to go to Pittsburgh. We got a show down there. And then West Virginia and then Tennessee. And now, oh, we got a, a three show run, Detroit, Grand Rapids and Chicago. Like, crap, I'm, I'm legit a touring musician. <laughs> like, oh shit, where did this come from? But I believe in the power of manifestation, right? You, you, mm -hmm. if you can conceive it and believe it, you can achieve it. There's nothing you can't do. Mm -hmm. And so I quit my union job because I'm, I'm, I'm making money off of merchandise now and music sales. Like I, I'm good. I don't need, I've always said if, when, if I ever sign a contract, I, I that's it. I'm going to focus on that full time. So there's actually still a good side hustle in the music industry on a local level because you can burn off a ton of your own CDs and you can sell them at $7 a pop and a lot yeah. of locals will buy them, right? Because you're playing yeah. a lot of shows and the locals see you at the shows so that you're able to, mm -hmm. to actually earn an income selling your own music, um, okay. which the label didn't like either. So, but uh, yeah. And then you start to learn about the pitfalls of the music game, you know, my guitar player has a heroin problem. My other guitar player has a drug problem. My other, my drummer is an alcoholic. Some, some musicians aren't going to work out. The label doesn't want this person in the band anymore because you're, while you're a good and fun live performer, you are not a skilled musician. So I, you can't even record a guitar track in the studio, right? I, I have to hire a studio musician to play your guitar parts because you're not quality quality guitar player Man. and so it's just it's more of an expense and then people drop off and then there's fake people and people don't show up people don't know what they don't don't want to pull their weight and so i find that i'm doing everything in this band and i don't have the financial resources to continue this project because i'm doing everything and so you know a year and a half later i'm done i, I i'm done with this i'm i'm not doing this anymore i owe the label you know five six thousand dollars because you nincompoops don't know how to act like grown ass adults. And so I quit, I quit that, that band. And I, I shortly thereafter joined another band as a bass player, a pretty good band. And they were well established and, and did a lot of the work. So I was, I was happy about that. But at the same time, I had gone through a metamorphosis in my life of the relationship that I was in and we had broken up and we had a, a kid and it was very tumultuous because at the same time, while I'd been through all. 18 years in prison. And I learned all those lessons. I hadn't been able to prepare or train for life in the free world. And this isn't the, like the first real relationship that I've ever been in. Plus I'm getting a lot of attention because of my music. And, you know, I'm, I'm learning to navigate through life, learning all these experiences. And so I knew I needed to get an actual job because music doesn't just pay you millions of dollars overnight. Who would have known? Who would have thought? Right. No. And so I went into a staffing company to get a part-time job and I met the owner and the owner it was an incredible dude, super multimillionaire. He owns the largest staffing company in Ohio and he pulled me into his office and we had a conversation. And when I left the office, I left with a career, a six figure career. And it was kind of mind blowing, right? I'm like, did that just happen? <laughs> I went in for a, the factory job. They told me that I was destined for. And I just walked out with a six figure career on salary, paid vacations, all this wonderful things. He gave me my own office and he said, I believe in you. You're an inspirational person and I want to help you. I'm going to pay you to talk to people. And so that's what I did. I joined this corporate staffing specialist community and I started getting people jobs, but at the same time, sitting them down and, and mentoring them through the process and giving them self-esteem encouragement while I'm giving you a job. And, and, and I had such a good rate of the guys I put to work, the men and women that I found jobs for kept their job, right? Because I interacted with them all. I would call them, Hey, how's the job going? Oh man, it's frustrating, blah, blah, blah. I would work them through their frustrations and they kept the job. So I had a really good rate and everything was just going really well in my life. Now my new band is really kicking ass. We're 
we're making music videos. We're playing shows. Things are going really well. I have a corporate gig that's paying me more money I ever thought I would make. I, I have my own home. I have several vehicles. Like life is going really, really good. And then COVID out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, to myself, and this is where choice comes into play. I'm thinking, are you fucking kidding me? All the <laughs> stuff I've been through in my life, surviving prison, surviving everything that I did, surviving all of these things, and to, to get to this position in my life where I actually have what looks like a, a wonderful rest of my life. Like, I'm going to be able to build up a wonderful retirement. I'm going to make a great amount of money. I'm going to have this amazing hobby of making music. I have a beautiful son, beautiful home, beautiful everything. And then COVID, I'm thinking to myself, the world just fucking hates me. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. I, what, why? Right. So I sit down in the house. I'm feeling sorry for myself for a couple of days. And I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do? It's a choice if I decide that I'm just going to lay down and, and, and take it. Right. If I'm going to just sit here and complain and cry about it, that's a choice. What can I do in this environment? And, and how can I get up? And I was laying on the couch watching YouTube, going through a YouTube channel. And I saw a reaction video by a guy named No Life Shack. And I was just captivated by this guy. I mean, he's just, he's a charismatic young man. And he pulled me in and I then binge watched, you know, 10 or 15 of his reaction videos. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy's got like a couple million subscribers and these videos have a couple million views that's gotta translate to money. Right. Uh -huh. So I'm not, I don't want to sit here and live off the tit of the government. And, and I know that we can't do anything because we're all locked down. What I can do this way better than what this guy's doing. Right. <laughs> I know I can. And so I went down into my basement and I turned on a webcam, which I didn't know how to use. Cause again, I've spent half my life in a can. I'm mm -hmm. not technologically savvy. I turned on, I still have the damn webcam. It's actually right here. I just don't use it anymore. It's right here. It's got <laughs> scratches and it's all beat up. Looks like my webcam. <laughs> and I turn on the old Logitech C922 and I, I'm trying to figure out how this works. How do I make the screen pop up and how do I, how do, I do that? So I'm just, I'm navigating through it and I, I just half-assedly figure out how to put it together. And I do a video. It's a mushroom head video. And... After I do it, I see, oh crap, I got 25 subscribers. Holy crap, 25 subscribers off of that video. Wow. And it's got like 150 views. I'm like, well, that's freaking cool. I'm going to do it again. So I did another video and now I've got 150 subscribers and that video got 300 views. And in the comment section, somebody's like, hey, react to this video for me. So I pull that video up and I do it. And then that one gets a thousand views. And you know, another 200 subscribers. I'm like, wait a minute, this is easy. Again, <laughs> if you just, no limits, I can do this. How do I make it look nicer? How do I make it sound better? How do I do this? And then I had a buddy of mine hit me up from North Carolina who had interviewed me from my band a while ago. He has a YouTube channel. He's like, oh, I do this. This is what I do. And so he brings me in and, and gives me just all kinds of tips, techniques, and tricks on how to, to make things look good and how to do things good. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to run with this. And literally within 30 days, I'm, you know, 2000 subscribers. I'm monetized on YouTube. I have an income. I'm making five, $600 a week. <laughs> I'm like, damn, this is working. Wow. Okay. Boom. And so I keep going. And now within 90 days, I've got 10,000 subscribers and I'm making a thousand dollars a week. <laughs> and then holy shit. Here we go. Like this is, this is going to work. And I keep going and I'm passionate about the music. I'm loving it. And now I have a spotlight and the, the most important thing that I'm passionate about is talking and helping people, right? I'm passionate mm -hmm. about speaking and imparting onto you the experiences and wisdom that I've accrued over my lifetime to help you feel better about yourself and live the life of your dream, right? Because they told me I wasn't going to be nothing but a janitor. I've already had a six figure job. I've already toured the country as a lead vocalist signed to a label. Now I'm blowing up on YouTube. There's nothing you can't do. You can do anything you want to do. I don't have any special gifts that nobody else has. This is just how you do it. So I started podcasting and I didn't even know that that was podcasting. I didn't know what it was. I just, I wanted to talk to people about mental health, happiness, kindness, compassion, authenticity, because these are the recipes to live a happy, healthy, productive, and successful life. There's a wonderful Bible quote in Proverbs. I think Proverbs is one of the most amazing 
manuscripts ever written. The more that a man increaseth his sorrow or his wisdom, the more he increaseth sorrow. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when you have an individual like that, that has learned all the programs, has all the tools and has all the knowledge and still lives in stuck in the past and has a shitty life. That's because you haven't learned the right things. You've learned the protocols and processes and steps and formulas that men have tried to put together to try to excuse past behavior. When it's as simple as saying, I just, I made stupid choices. I made to, I, I made choices based on my own selfish desires, wants, and needs. And I refused to accept accountability for my role and my, my part in the choices that I've made. And to protect my ego, I'm going to blame the circumstances around me instead of just saying I made a shitty choice. Mm -hmm. And so when someone learns accountability and learns how to say, okay, I made a shitty choice and I paid the price for it. And I, I accept that and I forgive myself and I forgive others that were a part of that. And I cannot change it. There's nothing I can do about it. And it's done, right? I'm going to let it go because we cannot change anything that happened at any point, right? That's why words are such a, a powerful thing because once you say them, you cannot take them back. They've been put out. And that's the same with any action in life. You can't change anything that's already happened. I can take this glass and throw it against the wall and I can never take that back. My response to that is my choice. Right. I can be mad that I just splashed coffee all over the wall. It's all over the floor. There's glass everywhere. Or I can, you know, I, and I can be mad at myself or I can try to learn a lesson from it and maybe see the artwork that's now on the wall from dripping coffee. And, and either way, I have to accept that it's happened and I can't change it. What can I do about it? And that's all that matters. Making correct decisions about what you can control. There's no control situations and there's control situations learn them. When you know you have no control over it, there's no point in expending ed effort and energy because time is the one thing you don't get back. And that's amazing what you just said. You hit two of my three key points that I try to get across to the people I work with. And the two key points that you brought up was forgive myself, forgive others. My number one is love yourself. Facts. Love yourself, forgive yourself, forgive others. If you can Facts. accomplish those three things, you're off and running. Facts. I mean, it's, it's a choice mm -hmm. as well, right? That is a choice. To forgive others and to forgive yourself is a choice. And mm -hmm. it starts with recognizing that you can't do anything about anything that's already happened, right? So there's holding on to it is a choice. Remaining a victim of your past is a choice. You're choosing to remain in that. Mm -hmm. Right. Work your demons out. If, if, if you're haunted by something from the past that it, that hurts you emotionally, write it down, write down what you can do about it, write down the solutions you would want to happen. And you'll come to learn that none of it's going to happen anyway. Right. And you, at, at the end of the day, you can't do anything about it. One of the greatest lessons that I was taught in that whole was relive your life, find out what emotion, what traumatic experience bothers you the most, write down what you would want done about it, right? Write down what solutions you would want. And then when you do that, now write down which ones can possibly happen. Select the ones from your list, which can happen. And at the end of the process, you come to discover none of them are a possibility, right? So you mm -hmm. literally just spent all that time to come to the conclusion that there's nothing you can do about it, <laughs> right? So it doesn't deserve any of your energy. If you're giving it energy, you're keeping yourself stuck in that mindset. Let it go, right? I can't focus on, I can't change that. There's nothing I can do about mm -hmm. it. And so tomorrow is a, mem is a dream. Yesterday is a memory. Today is what you can control. Focus on the next five minutes of your life and the next hour of your life and live by a set of principles and values that you hold dear. Live for kindness, live for, for love, live for compassion, mm -hmm. and you can never go wrong, right? If those three characteristics are the guiding light of every step you take in life, you will never go wrong, right? Because mm -hmm. love, kindness, and compassion work every time. Yep. Reminds me of the quote, your past is a statement, your future is a question mark. Right. It's, it, it's whatever you want to make it. 
beautiful. Know, the past is the past. It's a beautiful and thing. Your past, it's certainly a place of reference. You can learn from it. It's not That's a place right. of residence. You don't need to live there. 100%. I love that. That's very good. My, Mark Twain has my favorite quote of all time, which is, let us endeavor to live that when we come to die, even the undertaker will mourn. And when I read that quote, it was really life-changing for me. I have a couple of people that I idolize and strive to be like in my life. And one is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. All right. The dude has been through some really crazy things in his life and he turned it around and just by believing in himself and staying humble and, and, and staying in that, that position of belief and forgiving himself, he's able to live a good life and he's a very charismatic individual, but more so the man that, that I really emulate is Denzel Washington. I, I, I think Denzel Washington is one of the most prolific human beings of our generation. Mm -hmm. He never gave up on himself, no matter how much resistance he, he met and he's so well-spoken and, and articulate and wise in his delivery. You've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. <laughs> I loved, yeah. loved mm -hmm. when he said that. Never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. And if you fall or fail, fall forward, fail forward, mm -hmm. you know, falling backwards, it, it never served. It never makes sense, right? It doesn't serve mm -hmm. a purpose don't have a backup plan. I don't need a backup plan because I don't plan on falling back. I plan on falling forward and, and you continue to move forward. And, and so I, I, I studied these men and, and tried to incorporate some of their characteristics in my life, because at the end of the day, I've also discovered that personality is a choice, right? We are whoever we want to be. If you are an asshole, it's because you choose to be an asshole, right? There's <laughs> nobody on the earth that has made you an asshole, right? A lot of people will be like, oh, I'm, well, this happened to me in my life and this happened to me in my life and this happened to me in my life. So mm -hmm. I'm just a product of what's happened to me. That's a choice, mm -hmm. right? You've chosen to be that person because we can look at the Nelson Mandela's of the world. We can look at the Martin Luther mm -hmm. Kings of the world. We can look at mm -hmm. the Victor Frankl's of the world who mm -hmm. had their lives turned it upside down and torn apart by no fault of their own. They haven't done anything wrong. And yet they still were kind, compassionate human being, right? Gandhi is a wonderful example of this, you know? And so you have the choice, right? The things that have happened to you, I could be a bitter person, you know, with all the things that happened in my life with the, the sexual abuse and the incarceration of, of a child. And, and I could blame my whole life on that. What's the point? It doesn't change the fact that it happened. And I can choose to use those experiences in a positive light to try to help people, or I could be a piece of shit. It's my choice. Your personality is your choice. You can choose who you want to be. You want to be a kind, compassionate, nice person, do it. You, you can, you just be that, right? And, and your personality is not something, it's not a consequence. <laughs> your personality is not something foisted upon you. It's a choice. You get to choose. Everything in life is a choice. I could not agree with you more. And that is a very hard pill for people to swallow. Sure. It's so easy to blame outside forces, other people for my life. <clears throat> well, I didn't have this person in my life or so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, right here, right now, this is my life. What I choose to do is it, it's on me. It's nothing to do with Facts. the past. I can't travel back in time. I'm not... Michael J. Fox, I don't have a DeLorean. I can't go back in time and change things. <laughs> when this baby hits 88 miles per hour. Exactly. Serious shit. 1.21 yeah. gigawatts. And, and, that's, and that's what I've done with my life now. You know, I met my, my partner now. She's an incredible human being. And, and while we are diametrical opposites in almost everything in life, we are the same at our core. And we recognize that and identify that in each other. And we make such a great team and, and we have such a good life. And because we put out good to the earth, right? We moved to Palm Springs in June of 2021. And how can we make an impact in the world? How can we do something amazing to leave a legacy in this world that when I die, the undertaker's gonna bawl. He's gonna cry. And and you know, we started. She said, let's, let's, let's build a cat cafe. And I said, what the hell is that? 
it's a coffee shop with cats. Okay, let's do that. And and we it is proof that if you just put your efforts into what you believe in, nothing can stop you. And we did. We have the first cat cafe in the Coachella Valley. And the amazing amount things that have happened because of this choice that we've made is it's all inspiring every day, right? Like we've done 54 adoptions since we opened in December. And I mean, the, the road mm. to this cat cafe was, it, it was, it was hard, right? Like it cost three times as much as we thought it would. We ran into every bit of red tape you could imagine, but we just persevered because we know what good it's going to do. We know what we're doing is a good thing. And so we're not going to quit. We're not going to give up and, and we move forward. So we opened our doors in December. We've done 54 adoptions and some of the adoptions were just incredible. We had a triplet pair of 10 year old cats that had been together their whole life and their owner passed away. And these cats were seized from the home where they were with the body. And the, the, the shelter is like, I don't know what we're going to do. How do you get three 10 year old cats adopted? We don't want to break them up and separate them. How do we do this? And so we took that challenge on and it didn't take us long at all. I think it took a couple of weeks and we just talking to the right people. We found a lovely couple that came in and adopted all three cats and now they have a beautiful life. The cats have a beautiful life. The two men have a beautiful life. The whole thing is a beautiful thing. And it, it's, it reaffirms the, the, the belief that when you make the right choices, the right things happen when you're kind and compassionate, the light world is kind and compassionate to you. Some mm -hmm. people call it karma. I call it cause and effect. Right. And yeah. so I've been on that path now. We've been open for about six months and, and we're both go-getters. So it's what else can we do? How can we expand this? How can we expand to other people? And because we're not driven by money, money is not our driver. We need to make money to survive. But if you live within your purpose, money's going to come anyway. And so. I started volunteering out at the juvenile facility through some networking functions that I have gone to. I met a man named Coach C, who is a pastor out in Indio. And I don't do religion much at all. I'm a very spiritual person, but I don't do religion because at the end of the day, I think religion is an excuse. Yeah. And so he and I connected right off rip. And now I've been going into this juvenile facility, mentoring the juveniles, and it's, it's very full circle for me. I, I was never unlocked up as, as, a, as a juvie. I went from catching felonies and probation straight to prison. And so to be able to come in and maybe interject in these young men's lives and show them that there's an option, like you don't have to continue on this path. It is a choice. And if you choose to do this, this is going to be the consequence. If you choose to do this, this will be the consequence. And so that's very fulfilling. I also work with the anti-recidivism coalition in Los Angeles that's founded by Scott Budnick and they work with the recently released in, in currently incarcerated individuals to help them transition from locked up to freedom. And I'm a re-entry coach with what's called the ride home program, where we go pick inmates up from the penitentiary mm -hmm. and give them a, and we don't, I hate saying the word inmate cause it, it, it's, it's, I feel like it's a derogatory term, but yeah. most people aren't going to know what I'm talking about, but we go pick up the person from the prison and I, and we take them home, we take them out and give them a meal and we tell them what to expect because they don't give you this kind of information when you're leaving. When I, I was released from prison when I was 21 years old and given three condoms and $75 and told good luck. And I was raised by these wolves from 16 until I was 21. I was raised by convicts in prison and I went through a lot of trauma and crazy experiences. And I was not a good person for the 20 months that I was released when I was 21. And I landed back in prison with 12 more years. And so I know the importance of that first day out. And so I recently did a ride home with a young man named Joseph. And he went to prison when he was 15 for killing somebody in a gang altercation. And it was given a very long time. And he, he quickly got it. It took him a few years, but he started to see that he can turn his life around and started making a change from the inside and was just released last week. He's 28 years old after 13 years. He did the work to the point where they saw the change in him and gave him an opportunity. And so now he's out and I was able to give him that ride home and, and show him how the world works because life changes so much mm -hmm. in a handful of years and we give them the best effort. So that's, 
kind of where my life is at now. I'm, I'm passionate about being a re-entry coach and showing people that you have an option. You don't, this is not, you know, just cause you made this, this bad decision doesn't mean you have to be here for the rest of your life or I, I, and I, I recently saw the analogy of the coffee bean and it was so profound for me. I don't remember the guy's name, but there's a coffee bean analogy, which was really, it, it's probably the most profound thing I've seen, heard in a long time. In prison is like a boiling pot of water, right? And, and jail and, and even the environment, whatever environment you're in could be likened to a boiling pot of water. And if you put a carrot into that water, it becomes soft, right? It goes in hard and that hostile environment makes it hard or makes it soft. So if you go in there hard, you're going to get softened up, right? And if you put an egg in there, the egg becomes hard. It had a hard outside, but its heart got hardened by the environment that it was around and it became hard. So don't be an egg. But if you put a coffee bean into that boiling pot of water, what happens? Right? You have to change the name of the water, right? It, it, it's no longer water, it's coffee, right? The coffee mm. bean changes its environment. So the environment around you does not dictate who you are. Be a coffee bean, change the environment around you, right? And just that, it, it impacted me so much. I'm like, yes, yes, be a coffee bean, right? Change, change the environment you're in and watch what happens, right? That's, that is definitely... Some inspiring stuff. I've seen it hundreds of times. Somebody's released. They're just out there to the world. They don't know where to go or nothing, but to try yep. to at least have somebody to pick them up and try to get them to, to where they need to go. Yeah. Is, is huge. You know? Well, it, it's not only that, it's, it's hard because the justice system doesn't want people to get it right. Because there's a massive monetary side to this, right? Prison is a business, right? Especially in this country. There's approximately 8 million people incarcerated in the world. And 2.7 of them are in the United States. We make up 25% roughly of the, the world's incarcerated population. And yet we only make up 5% of the global population. That is... How does that even work? We spend $200,000 a year on each child incarcerating them and $5,000 on educating them. What, how does that make sense? Right? At any given day, there's 50,000 juveniles that are incarcerated. And, and when we first started juvenile justice reform in this country in, in 1890 in Cook County, Illinois, outside Chicago, mm -hmm. the first juvenile court had one room with a judge and the judge was dressed in a suit, right? There was no court reporters. There were no defense attorneys. There were no prosecuting attorneys. There were no benches. There were no robes. You sent the kid in and the judge talked to him, right? And that was it because children are different than adults. And if you look at court now, how the hell do you convict a seven-year-old of a felony right? for larceny? It doesn't make sense. He doesn't possess criminal capacity. If a seven-year-old commits a felony, there's something going on in that seven-year-old's life, mm -hmm. right? No, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. something is wrong in this child's life and you need to identify that and help them. And so there's such a massive monetary side to it that they don't want to release people. They don't educate people that are about to get out that you can do anything you want. You can accomplish any goals you want. Here is how a cell phone works now. Here's how a smartphone works. Here's how a tap debit card works. Here's mm -hmm. how they, they don't do that because they want you to fail. Mm -hmm. And that's why they are so hard on juvenile dust are calling kids, super predators and locking them up because you're training them to be adult criminals, because when they get out, they're going to recidivate and they're going to come back. And that's mm -hmm. more money for the government, right? The, 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 the owners of the facilities see it as a business. They, they need to make money. You have to have asses in, in bunks in order to make that money. <laughs> Because you get, what, thirty to $35,000 a year per inmate to take care of them. We spend millions and millions of dollars a year on incarceration, and it's, mm -hmm. it's disgusting. They don't, they don't want it to stop, right? And when we educate people that are incarcerated to this fact, this is one of the things that I try to drive home to the juveniles every time I'm in there to talk to them. 
It's modern day slavery, first of all. The disproportionate amount of African Americans and Latino Americans that are incarcerated is, is ridiculous. It's off the charts. And it's modern day slavery. If you're out here hustling and selling dope and breaking the law, you're literally putting yourself into slavery because once they get their hands in you, they're not going to let go, right? They're going to hold on as hard as they can until you change the environment, until you become a coffee bean and change the environment. They're going to keep making money off you. And you're literally sitting in here. And I ask this question all the time. How many of you are hustlers? And all their hands go up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you're all hustlers, right? How much are you making right now? You're not making a penny. Mm -hmm. Real hustlers. Yeah are that CO, that CO, that CO, yeah. that warden. Mm -hmm. Those are the hustlers. They're, they're literally building a building that they're going to make money off from you to come vacate, to, to be vacant, it, right? They, they want you to come occupy this building and right. gonna make a buttload of money off of you. And while you're here, they're going to sell your labor to these companies for tons of money and pay you pennies a day, right? It's slavery. Yeah. And that's yeah. why, that's why there's no real hard reform for justice because there's no real hard let's go look at these laws and stop locking up a 13 year old because he's mm -hmm. got you know a half an ounce of cocaine and let's put him in prison for 10 years for that mm -hmm. that's yeah said. yeah and i always tell the guys especially most of them hey i'm a hustler or whatever i'm like guess what the true hustlers don't go to jail the tippy top of the people that are dealing this stuff they never go to jail and then once you get caught up in the system, then you become another pawn. So yep. your entire life gets fighting against being controlled. But guess what? You were controlled before you got in. You're controlled once you get in. And then it's kind of a repeated cycle. Yeah. Like there isn't another, another option. There is. Uh, you know, and, and so many people come from broken families and broken homes and broken environments. Yeah. And most people just want, if you ask people, what you want out of life. Most of them will say financial freedom and family, right? That's what you want. And the path that you're on when you get, start getting incarcerated and hustling doesn't lead to that, right? That's a choice. If that's the life you want, that's the life you have to pursue, right? You, this, this is not going to get it. And, and it's, it's just so bad, right? When it becomes a rite of passage for a lot of these younger kids, because they come from families, one in, one in 10 people know somebody that's incarcerated or that have been into prison. And so it becomes a, a rite of passage, especially like in LA and California and some of the cities out here and, and across the whole country in these metropolises and big cities, it becomes a rite of passage. They see the other gangbangers that have been through there. Mm -hmm. And when they go, it's like, they see a whole bunch of their friends like, oh man, what's up, bro? About time you got here, Mama, I missed you. And they don't, yeah. it's, it's hard for them to anticipate the mental drawbacks and mental consequences that you're going to suffer because the sad reality is that you're going to survive prison, right? You're going to go there mm -hmm. and you're going to make it. You might get a couple bumps and scrapes and scratches and scars along yeah. the way. You're going to make it. And the problem that they can't see is the mental effects that it's going to have, right? Like I still struggle with brand new clothing, right? I, I just, it doesn't feel right because I'm so used to the shit clothing that I wore for half my life. Quality food tastes oh, like food. ass to me, right? <laughs> like a, a quality, this is a quality meal. It's going to cost you an arm and a leg and it tastes like crap. I'd rather go eat McDonald's because McDonald's is shit food. And that shit food is what I'm used to my, most of my life. You have to break down the habits that you've been taught from incarceration and from jail in these are the consequences that they, they can't foresee that they don't think about. And, and I tried to, to give that to these kids and, and help them see like, this is what is, is going to haunt you in 15 years, right? Not the fact that you've been in prison. You, you mean, you can, anybody can get over that, you know? And so it's the mental drawbacks and mental side effects that, that they need to understand that will happen. Yeah. I Tell the guys all the time, of course, I work with ladies too. There's always complaints about the food. Food's crap, oh, food's this, food's that. Sure. Hey, I said, can you imagine that a $2 burrito at Taco Bell is going to taste better than anything that you're going to eat all week? Think about that once you get out and realize, you know, I might need to do some things differently so I can get that $2 burrito. Right. If they so, fed you good gourmet food, 
you'd never want to leave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I always say like, if I had a, a truth gun and I could point at somebody and Hey, tell me the truth. And if I pointed it at everybody that's incarcerated, like who's comfortable being here, how many people would you think would say, eh, I'm all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Probably it's, quite a bit. Probably yeah, quite a bit. They've, it, it's, it's easier to be locked up. You have less responsibility, right? You don't yeah. have, you know, and, and some people fall into that. I know plenty yeah. of guys that they do small, stupid crimes. So they're in and out of prison or most of their lives because they're homeless when they hit the streets and they don't have any other options. So they go out during the summer months and commit some stupid parole violation when it starts getting cold and then they go to the winter locked up. Yep. yep. And yep. It, it, it's unfortunate because those type of people also perpetuate the monetary side of it, why the government doesn't want to fix things because there are people that take advantage of the system like that. And it's, it's an unfortunate thing, man. I know from the years that I've worked with incarcerated individuals, I think they're finally seeing the psychological impact and they're actually trying to put, I mean, they could put a lot more resources into helping individuals, but I think it's gotten to the point now where a lot of people are really taking notice of, okay, well, we need to get to the root of the problem rather than just keep seeing the same people sure. over and over to try to reduce sure. that recidivism. Well, there is a, a cultural mindset that's starting to grow mm -hmm. uh, because of people like Scott Budnick and programs like the Anti-Recidivism Coalition and, and these other groups and nonprofits that are trying to educate inmates. There is a cultural awareness that's starting to, to, to take place, but it's still a long road, right? Uh -huh. and, and I think if people pay attention, they're going to see the, the evil machine that we're up against, right? To, because we are up against an evil machine and they will, they don't care about humanity. And it's been, I, I mean, it's, it's a fight that's been going on for thousands of years, right? right. It's not like it's, it, we're not something, it's not something new, right? And all we can do is, is as human beings is, is do our best to be a coffee bean. Right? change the environment <laughs> around us and educate the people that are around us so that they may live a better life. I'm not, I'm not the kind of speaker that's going to go out here and tell you, well, here's four steps to this. And there's, here's the seven keys to this. And here's the, the mm -hmm. three pyramids that unlock this. I'm not, I, I, here's the account of what I have been through. And here's the lessons that I've learned from it and how I implement these lessons into my life to live a happy life. And if you pay attention to me, I live a very happy life. I'm very fulfilled. I'm very happy. My life is the best I've ever had it. And I'm so in love with my life. And if I can help one human being, just one person to take a lesson, awesome. And now I've done that. I've helped way more than one. And so I just want to continue living that legacy and leaving that behind so that when I die, people might say, this man left the world better than it was when he found it, regardless of the crazy circumstances that he had to endure. And hopefully that's an inspiration to somebody and, and I can help somebody else live a better life. Yeah. That's what it's all about. You definitely keep doing what you're doing, man. Definitely will. That's the whole purpose of the book, right? My book is, is my manual for what worked for me. And I'm yeah. very confident that it can work for anybody. You don't have to be in a cell for 19 months to go through a transition, to go through a metamorphosis. It's, a, it's not about the environment. It was about the process. And that mm -hmm. process is what can alleviate any, anything from affecting you. Nothing affects Right. Nothing. It can, my life can fall apart today. And tomorrow I'm going to come out with a big, dumb smile on my face and try to inspire everybody around mm -hmm. me. And I learned that from Victor Frankl. If you, yep. you know, man's search yep. for meaning is one of the most influential books of my life. This was a, a Jewish man who had every, it worked hard and had a great life. Everything in his life was good until the Nazis came along and imprisoned him, took everything from him, killed members of his family, killed tons of people around him. Mm -hmm. And he smiled through it all and try to inspire people to be happy and understand that we're going to get through this. Some of us will, some of us won't, but we're going to, we're going to not allow the environment to dictate our peace of mind because they can take this, but they can't take this. They cannot touch your mind. They can't, they can't affect it unless you allow it to. 
And so I live my life by that. And, and it's a happy life, right? <laughs> Everything's good. And so even when bad things happen, I accept it. I process the emotion of it. If it makes me sad, I cry. If it makes me angry, I get mad. If it makes me happy, I get joyous. Right? I feel it, I process the emotion, and then I move on because mm -hmm. there's no point in hanging on to any of it. Just let it go. The accidental Buddhist. Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm a firm believer that Viktor Frankl, that should be a required reading for a Should be a curriculum, being. right, in yes. school. Yes. Yeah. Good. Definitely so, should. so inspiring. Well, right? I'm, I'm hoping that my book can at some point become a book that helps heal. And helps people in the world. So you guys can check it out. And it would be awesome if you went and picked up a copy. You should do that. It'll be on sale September 1st. All right. Well, I will definitely put a link to that on my website. Thank you so much. And the website is called heywhiteboy.com. And I, we got the title from, obviously, I, I think I already talked about it, but the Muslim man, that's what he used to say every day. Hey, white boy, come talk to me. <laughs> And so it's Hey White Boy, Conversations of Redemption. And it's published by Anywhere With You Publishing. We built our own publishing company. And, you know, there's nothing you can't do. Man, you can do anything you want. All righty. Well, I think that's a good spot to wrap it up. Thank you so much for having me, James. I greatly appreciate it. I, Thanks, man. I, I greatly appreciate you taking the time cool. out of your morning. And hopefully we can do this again. No doubt. I like it. Let's see what the future holds. I'm totally in. All right. Well, that was our interview with Sunny Von Cleveland. Please keep a lookout for his book. You can find all of his information on his website, heywhiteboy.com. Please support him and what he's doing. I think he is definitely helping a lot of people. Please follow our podcast. We're on Twitter anger underscore llc we're on instagram freedom from anger llc we'll try to post some more videos of our interviews and easiest way to keep track of that is just follow the podcast follow us on uh, all the social medias i'm trying to get better at that so time will tell so until next time, if you have any questions for us or any ideas for a future podcast or you think you might want to inquire about some of our services, please go to our website, freedomanger.com. That's the easiest way to get a hold of me. And until next time, as always, stay safe. Mm -hmm.